to welcome you, Bill, uh, Dr. Bill Radford. Uh, Bill is the uh, Vice President for Access and Strategic Development for the Vancouver Community College. He is here today to uh, do a seminar in our CHET series. And the title of the seminar is Post-Secondary Internationalization and Hyper-Diverse City Contexts. What I want to do is, for the benefit of those folks who can't be here today, is ask Bill a few questions about uh, his work, and see so if we get a sense of what he will be doing in the seminar, even though you can't be here. So Bill, first of all, let me ask you about, uh, about your initial interest in the topic, you know, what brought you to the topic, and, and, and why. Okay, well, um, it's, uh, I've, I've been in the business of loosely termed international education for about 20 years. Um, I found myself at Simon Fraser University as Director of Internationalization. Um, but it, it was a very sort of pers a, a personal feeling of discontent. Um, there's, a, there's a quote that I like to use from, actually from Anais Nin, from her 41 Diaries, where she says there's an ugliness in, doing, in, in being paid for something you're not comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And I was feeling that sense of ugliness, and I, I didn't know whether it was my, just my own experience of a trajectory through a particular field. What was it? So th that, that essentially was what propelled me into the research that I ended up doing for my thesis, in actual fact. It had to do with two things. One was the fact that um, I'd spent, I'd started off in international education working in international development on CEDA projects, doing um, capacity building in developing countries, you know, with, with all, of the, um, all of the associated mandate that CEDA had mm -hmm. and the relationship with Canadian universities in the late 80s all the way through probably to the late 90s, where there are lots of things going on uh, for all of the, the good reasons that CETA did those things back then. Mm -hmm. Fast forward 20 years, I found myself in international education essentially being a salesman and essentially selling uh, a commodified packaged international education internationally. And so I, I, I sort of found myself having gone from somewhere where I was involved in a, a sort of transformative process, hopefully, it didn't work always, but it did sometimes in, in working in international education, into somewhere where I was a purveyor of educational goods. And I wondered if that was my personal experience. So my sort of uh, learning journey through my research was to test out whether my, it was purely personal or whether there was a systemic issue with commodification in, in education internationally. The second part of it was I was sort of struck by the fact, because you know, I was traveling to conferences, uh, what, whatever, um, in educational partnerships, and I was going to places, Sweden, Australia, and um, Vancouver all came together in a particular way. I traveled from here to Sweden, then to, um, to, uh, to Brisbane, actually, then back to Vancouver, all within the space of about six weeks. And it was very interesting because I, I sort of was on the way to the airport here in Vancouver and I was being driven by a Punjabi guy with, uh, you know, in his taxi. And then I got to Malmo, Sweden, and it uh, was the same thing. There was an Afghani guy who was driving me in his taxi. And then in, the, um, then in Brisbane, it was another Punjabi guy. And then back to Vancouver, and it was another Punjabi guy driving the taxi when I came home. And I, I had, you know, these, in some senses, these people were the same person in these very different diverse city contexts. And, you know, the Australian had some Australian accent and the Canadian Punjabi guy had some uh, accoutrements of Canadian culture in, on his dashboard and so on. But I was thinking, well, hold on a second. These guys are themselves internationalizing. Mm -hmm. They're people who are diasporic, yet um, they're cosmopolitan men and in one instance, women, and they, uh, they're living internationalized lives. And doesn't the discourse of internationalization, at least in the literature, um, and the sort of, it, it, it isn't, aren't they actually connected to that? And why doesn't the discourse of internationalization that I know connect with those realities of these hyper-diverse cities, these diversifying cities, and what's, what's going on there? So those were the two questions that I had, was is, is, is international education turning to commodification? Mm -hmm. Is there a systemic uh, issue there? What does the literature say about that? Is there anything else going on? Is there anything to counterbalance that? And um, 
what is the connection between internationalization and the sort of methodologies and the, the normative processes that are going on at the moment and the movement globally towards much more diverse cities and the movement towards urbanization and uh, what's going on there. So that was the exploration. Mm-hmm. That, was, that, was the, that was the beginning. But it was a very personal sense of discontent that drove me in the first place into this. And at that stage of my career, doing a PhD is, is a self-indulgence. And so I was indulging my own exploration. Mm-hmm. And that was really what this is about. So we've got the moral imperative. And the yes, the moral imperative is definitely there. Yeah. And, and the focus is on Vancouver as a city context? No, I, 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 the, the part of the problem with doing an interdisciplinary dissertation, which I realized it was at the end of the process rather than the beginning, um, was that, that I had to... I just sort of read myself into literatures that I had not explored before. I know the educational literature well. I have a master's in adult ed. I, you know, I know all of the internationalization literature in education. However, I found that I had to go into philosophy, uh, cosmopolitanization, and I had to go into urban geography and literature which I wasn't familiar with. So I began to explore that, and actually I didn't. I realized that although Vancouver is a Yes, it's a, a, a hyperdiverse city. There is a network of hyperdiverse cities around the world. So yes, Vancouver, of course, because I live here, provided my focus. And it's the thing that's most palpable and most immediate. But if you're in this international education business, of course, you have the privilege of visiting numerous similar cities. And I realized that uh, you know, Toronto, Vancouver, Melbourne, Malmo, London, you name them, mm-hmm. They all have more in common with one another than they do with cities and towns 50 kilometers away from them. So Toronto has more in common with Vancouver than it does with Peterborough, which is 50 kilometers away. Um, Vancouver has more in common with Toronto than it does with Mission or Squamish and so on and so forth. So, so, so it, yes, it was about Vancouver in the sense that I live here, and you know, obviously that was the most obvious example to me. but. Um, it, it became an exploration of of a, of, of a of a urbanization phenomenon laid alongside the ex, the commodification of education, and I began to wonder what is the connection, if there is one, between urbanization, um, hyperdiversity, hyperdiversity in cities, and international education, and that was the that was the exploration. And so, I could have done a. Um, uh, a an empirical study and, and chosen three or four st- uh, four cities. Um, th- I, I didn't want to do that because I felt that there was a sort of um, I wanted to explore the methodological underpinnings here and what was going on philosophically and what was going on morally. And quite frankly, um, it, had I done the empirical study, uh, it it wouldn't have been as as deep as I needed this to be, or as, or it drove itself into being. So the findings are about are about cosmopolitanism. Yeah, I, 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 you know, as as with these things, you need to you, you need to find a guide. So essentially, what I found was that you know the literature bears out my own experience. Mm-hmm. Yes, international education is essentially about commodification. It's about sales. There are, there's a little bit of emergent scholarship um, which basically says we've got to get away from the internationalization to cosmopolitanization um, because if you stay in the sort of national methodological paradigm, you're always going to be stuck in a view which, review, which views other, everything from a national perspective and, a nas- and the national project. Um, if you start to think about cosmopolitanization, then you think about individuals, communities, and you begin to delink that from the national project. Mm-hmm. And so in the literature, there are a couple of people, Rizvi, uh, Vinokur in France, um, uh, uh, people um, you know, who are beginning to say, well, hold on a second, this is what's going on here, but the only way to break free from internationalization in its current paradigm mm-hmm. is to stop thinking about the national and therefore the international and begin to think about the cosmopolitan and the cosmopolitical. And so that, so I, I found, you know, one, one always looks for a guru or a guide in these things. And I found that in Ulrich, Ulrich Beck, yes. who is a, a German sociologist, and um, he talks about the sort of zombie nature of higher education, the fact that we need to pay attention to third modernity, 
and uh, it was very complex stuff. I certainly found it challenging, but he basically, essentially, says you, you know you got to you got to break yourself out of what he calls the narcissism of the national perspective. Begin to think about the cosmopolitan. That led me um, into Saskia Sassen and many of the people who are global geographers. Uh, Chris Olds from the University of Wisconsin Madison, was, who's actually a graduate at UBC, was very helpful to me um, in this. And um, t t taking the global city, the hyperdiverse city, as a place which actually is in many ways divorced from the national identity and the national context, and these cities are creating their own identities in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. That then led me back to global geographic, the history of global geography and the relationship of universities to, for example, the Venice-Ukraine corridor, which in which you know scholars in the Venice, the Venetian century, um, moved backwards and forwards uh, by water. Um, it led me to Timbuktu, where there were 25,000 scholars in pre-BC times from the Muslim world moving across that sort of strata of Middle East as we know it now, into Africa. And um, it, so it, it, it led me into that realization that cities actually are the sort of the concretization of globalization, if you like, and divorce from the national. And that if international education is to remake itself, there's an opportunity there to think about, the, rather than a sort of systemic divorce, to think about an affiliation and an affection for, if you like, global cities and this network, but also an opportunity to look very critically at this, because the uh, global cities theory talks about this essentially says that these hyperdiverse cities are essentially populated by a very small elite who control power, intellectual power and capital, um, and that the only way that these cities sustain themselves is by intense and extensive migration. And so I um, theorized that if actually you look at international education, you can actually look, for example, in Vancouver, and this will be in my next PhD, but I don't have time to do that. One can say, for example, that the research-intensive universities, their international education efforts are actually there to promote and to um, inculcate the elite. So they're there essentially purveying a credential, which then becomes an elite accoutrement, which allows those elites then to circulate amongst the power centers of each of those cities, which they do, and there's some, in fact, airline data which suggests that that's true. Whereas in the Vancouver context, or the Malmo context, or the Melbourne context, for example, um, if you look at the international education, the attraction of international students into the um, other half of the cont uh, higher education continuum, the colleges, the technical institutes, that international education essentially fuels that stratification of society. So all of these, all of these things came together for me and suggested that, um, and Beck suggests this, there are going back to people like um, Giroux, people like Peter McLaren, you can actually look at those and say, okay, well, wait a minute, we need some sort of humanistic um, injection of, of a, hum a human purpose back into this international education field, and we need to begin to look at how, um, a, 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 what we're actually doing. Are we colluding with, 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 with the strata of power? And are we actually institutionally um, have we been co-opted by the sort of industri military industrial complex? A few people like Neufeld in the U.S. have actually suggested that universities in the U.S., particularly the intensive private research universities, are actually obviously collusive in that. And that the, and that the colleges, that the, those who are sort of out of the, out of the rankings is, is what I would suggest, the, the, they're actually doing a very different kind of internationalization. They're actually perpetuating power structures in these major cities. The other side of the coin, um, which again I didn't have time to explore, otherwise my thesis would have taken another 10 years, was the sense that whereas these diverse cities are cosmopolitanizing in the northern hemisphere, there's an anti-cosmopolitanization going on in the developing world. So if you look at cities like Mumbai, you look at cities like Johannesburg, you look at cities like Port Elizabeth. I was talking to somebody yesterday from Nelson Mandela University who's actually um, working on this and is very worried about it. That the, 
going back back to the roots of international education, which was essentially premised on a rather loose, wishy-washy theory of global citizenship and, uh, you know, rights, Martha Nussbaum type stuff, um, that it's it's critical that the field re-engage with that and take a critical position on what's going on in international education. Um, because although cosmopolitanization is I- I- in cities, is I- in the hyperdiversities in the northern hemisphere, is is interesting and, in some senses, you know, could be rejigged. In developing countries, these massive cities, which are actually going in the opposite direction, they were um, Mumbai, Johannesburg, uh, Rio de Janeiro, and so on and so forth, were far more. Um, Damascus were far more liberal and far more cosmopolitan in um, previous uh, previous decades and previous centuries than they are now. So you've got a very you've got a stratification there going on. Uh, the problem with the thesis was it was you know it's quite sprawling and I um, I found myself adrift and I, I would sort of say this to anybody who. Uh, I'm not sure I would repeat the experience, mm-hmm. but I, w- I, I didn't know what I didn't know. Right. And so it was fascinating. I mean, I, I, I would suggest that anybody who's in international education or internationalization, you absolutely have to read Diogenes, you know, and you absolutely have to read Martha Nussbaum, mm-hmm. and you absolutely should read Ulrich Beck. But similarly, you should read Saskia Sassen and Peter Hall and the global geographers, because I don't think you can, um, you, you, you can't segregate them any longer if you're going to truly produce scholarship, which is, which is which is which is real of now and takes you into action, which is of course the tradition that hopefully anybody in education comes from. Thank you. That yeah. was really. Great, Bill. I, I think we've got a great summary, of, uh, and all the people at Auntie, I'm sure, regretting that they weren't able to come. No, I, I don't know about that, but it, it was. It, I mean, it, it, it was. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this. The problem, the thesis. The problem with this is. Um, there's, there's a woman at uh, at SFU who um, named Anne Chinnery. I don't know if you know Anne. I, I think I do actually. Yeah. So, I, so Anne is a philosophy education professor, and and she's the reason that I had the either courage or foolishness, I'm not, not sure which, to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I said, with, said to her as I was going through the process, this is really messing with my head, Anne. And she said, well, it's good, it's supposed to. Uh, and the trouble is, it messed with my head so much that I actually left my job at SFU as a result of the conclusions in my thesis. So, so that, you know, you have to, to be careful about this, because there are, there are dangerous implications if you really take it seriously. Well, thanks so much. Thank you.